I'm Jacob Hockel from Troop 402. I'll be reading the Old Testament, Psalms 122, to 1 through 9. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within our gates of O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that was bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as we decreed from Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. Their thrones of Je for judgment were set, the throne's house of David. Prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secured who love you. Peace be within our walls and security within our towers. For the brother and companion's sake, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. This is the word of the Lord. to say thank you to all of the scouts that have been participating in worship. Haven't they done a fantastic job? We are so grateful for you. We are taking a break today from the sermon series that we have been doing for the past couple weeks, uh, 1 Corinthians. We're talking today about worship. Why do we worship? Why have we gathered here today on this gloomy, dreary, drizzly day? Some of you, I know, are here because you've been dragged here. You were informed by the powers that be in your household that this was where you were going to be and there was no discussion. We're still glad you're here. And some of you are here out of habit. This is what you do on Sunday mornings. You come to worship. It's a good habit to have, by the way. Some of you are here because you're lonely. There's too much quiet, too much space in your house, and this is a place where you can come and be among people you love, people who love you. Some of you are here because you feel guilty. You have done something wrong, something you knew you shouldn't do, or you have left undone something good that you knew you should do, and you have come for forgiveness. You've come to feel better. Some of you are here because you are afraid, you are anxious, the future is a scary place and you've come for assurance or reassurance. And hopefully, hopefully some of you have come because you really, truly desire to worship the Lord. You feel the need, the desire within you to bow before God, the creator of the universe, and to say, you are God, I am not. You've come to acknowledge how worthy God is of our praise, our attention, our loyalty, our service, our obedience. You have felt the need, the desire to express your joy in the Lord and to hear his word read and proclaimed and to offer your prayers and your gifts. That's what we're talking about today, the worship of God. And we have an example of that kind of worship read for us in our first scripture reading for today of King David giving this kind of worship. Now, a little bit of history. At this point in the history of Israel, David was very new on the throne. He hadn't been king for very long. His predecessor, King Saul, had been killed in battle against the Philistines. It's a whole different story for another day. But David was brand new on the throne. He was establishing himself, establishing his power, his authority over the entire nation of Israel. And he was doing so, one of the ways, by establishing a new capital city, the city of Jerusalem, which he had just recently conquered. And to do that, 
One of the things he's doing to establish Jerusalem as the political and religious center of Israel is he is bringing in the tabernacle. Some of you may remember reading about the tabernacle in the Old Testament. It's basically just a tent, a really fancy tent, but basically just a tent. Until David's son Solomon built the permanent temple in Jerusalem as God's house, this tent served as the movable house of the Lord. It was the one place in the whole earth where God had chosen to set his presence. This is before the coming of Jesus, before the coming of the Holy Spirit. The one place God's presence dwelled on earth was enthroned on the Ark of the Covenant within this beautiful tent. And David was bringing all of that into Jerusalem, his capital city. God was literally coming to town. And David responds with this incredible worship that we read about, that as he brought up the Ark of the Covenant into the city with rejoicing, when those who had borne the Ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal, and he danced before the Lord with all his might. He worshiped with every bit of who he was. Have you ever worshiped like that? Have you ever worshipped God with all your might? Have you ever been so overwhelmed with joy in the Lord, with joy in who God is, with joy in what God has done for you, with joy in the promises of what God will do for you in the present, in the future, that you have sung and danced and worshiped with all of your might. I realize I'm asking that question of a room full of Presbyterians, okay? We don't generally dance with all our might in our worship. We don't generally worship with this kind of gusto. Our worship tends to be far more reverent. I'm reminded of a time I went to a a Presbyterian conference and the worship leader up front was getting ready to introduce for us a particularly upbeat, joyful song that we were all going to sing together, and she referenced this scripture passage in her introduction. She said, we read in 2 Samuel 6 that David danced with all his might before the Lord. We, however, are Presbyterians, and we may not be comfortable doing that. So as you sing the next song, she said, I hope you tap your toe with all your might before the Lord. It tends to be the way we worship. And that's okay. Reverence is appropriate. We should be reverent in worship. We are, after all, coming into the presence of God, the creator of the universe, the presence of God, the one who knit us together in our mother's wombs, the one who knows how many hairs are on our heads, the one who has numbered all of our days. We're coming into the presence of God who spins the planets in their orbits. Of course we should be reverent. Of course we should follow that unofficial Presbyterian motto, everything decent and in order. Of course we tend to be rather cerebral in our worship. We worship first and foremost with our mind in the Presbyterian tradition, and all of that is good. But we also need to be careful in all this reverence, in all this decency in order that we don't forget to worship with our hearts as well, to worship with our emotions. God created those also, and they are. We have to be sure we don't forget that each worship service we have is 
a celebration. It is joyful. Sometimes worship can seem rather stuffy and boring. We miss sometimes the joy of coming into the presence of God. We miss sometimes the fact that we are coming because we have the most incredibly good news that has ever been given to anybody, which is that this David we read about had a family, and there was a promise given by God, nurtured down through the generations, that from David would come the Savior of the world. And eventually, one day in a little town called Bethlehem, that Savior was born. His name is Jesus. He is God-made man. He is the fullest expression of revelation that God has given to anybody the greatest gift that God has ever given. And he lived a perfect life as our representative, and he died an atoning death as our representative on the cross. He died the worst, the most excruciating, the most humiliating death that we have ever invented to execute somebody. He was crucified. And for three hours one Friday, he hung on that cross as our representative, and he took upon himself every terrible thing we have ever done. All the times we have stolen, all the times we have lied, all the times we have cheated. He took all the times we have ever torn people down with our hateful, cruel words, all the times we have ever torn ourselves down with those words. He took all of our jealousy, all of our hatred, all of our lust, all of our greed, all of our petty, hypocritical judgments. He took all the times we have wasted our potential, all the times we have wasted our gifts, all the times we have wasted our money, all the times we have wasted our days. He took all of our junk all of our guilt, all of our shame, all of that baggage we drag around with us from our past. He took all of that upon himself, all of the things we pray nobody ever finds out that we have done, all of our shameful little secrets. He took it upon himself. He bore the punishment for each one of those sins. He died so that we wouldn't have to, and he covered over all of that stuff with his blood. And on the third day, on Sunday, he rose again from the dead. And he conquered death. And he took away the pain and the sting and the fear of death. And by doing so, he promised that all of us who put our faith in him, all of us that put our trust in him, we have the hope, we have the promise that we also will rise again as he did from the dead one day, and we will go and be with him in his presence for all eternity. We don't deserve this gift. We couldn't earn it if we tried. He did all this just because that's the kind of God he is. He's kind, he's good, he's loving, he's merciful. And he calls us now to respond. He calls us to accept all of this for ourselves as our own. And when we do, he promises to give us his Holy Spirit, to fill us with his own presence in and with us. He's promised to bind us together to Jesus Christ so that we can know God, not just know facts about God, but really know God, have fellowship with God, take strength and joy from God. Meaning each one of us then becomes a little Ark of the Covenant here on earth, a place where God chooses to set his presence here on earth. God has done all of this for us. And for all of this, for this incredibly fantastic, wonderful, amazing good news of a God who gives us all of this when we deserve none of it, we come here every Sunday, the day that he rose again from the dead. 
And we join together with others who believe as we do in this space that we have set aside just for this purpose, and we worship. We sing. We offer our prayers. We offer our gifts. We may even, some of us, raise our hands a little bit. We may tap our toes. We might even, when we go crazy, move around a little bit as we worship the Lord. It's not unheard of even in a Presbyterian church because this news we have is so good and so amazing and so wonderful, we can't help but do it. But sometimes we forget. Sometimes we get distracted. Sometimes we miss the reason that we have come into this place, and our focus goes off of that good news. Our focus goes off of the goodness of God, and it goes on to ourselves instead. We've got an example of that in our scripture reading as well. In Michael or Michal, I've heard her name pronounced both ways. But we read that as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And when David returned to bless his household, Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, Oh, how the king of Israel has honored himself today, uncovering himself before the eyes of his female servants, like a vulgar fellow, shamelessly uncovers himself. Michal was the daughter of David's predecessor, King Saul. She was also his first wife. And notice that while the whole town is out worshiping, while the whole town is greeting the coming of God into their city, and joining with David and singing and dancing and and worshiping the Lord. She is in the palace looking down, literally and figuratively, upon what is going on. And she does not like what she sees. She does not like the fact that in her eyes, her husband is being undignified. He's not acting the way a king is supposed to act. He's not wearing his royal robes. We're told he wore a simple linen garment like everybody else. And he wasn't high up on a throne establishing his power and his authority. He's down among the common rabble making a spectacle of himself. And she doesn't like that one bit. And she lets him know. She gives her sarcastic critique of how her husband has made himself undignified. And in the process, she missed the whole point of what was going on, that God was coming into her town to be near her. All she could see was her own discomfort. And she let David know, and David let her know what he thought of her critique. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. So how have you come to worship today? Like David? Like Michal? Have you come to fix your eyes upon Jesus Christ, upon all the blessings, the good news of his salvation, the fact that he is here right now among us? Are you responding with all of your might? No matter what your neighbor down on the other end of the pew might think of it? Or are you standing back, not going to get involved? not going to join in what everyone else is doing, instead critiquing all that is going on around you? 
Are you joining in, singing the hymns, praying the words, lifting your heart to the, to the Lord, or are you grading the hymns as to whether or not you like them? Are you engaging in the liturgy? Are you speaking those words to the Lord? Are you praying those prayers in your heart and your mind to the Lord? Or are you critiquing all the times the worship leader may have stumbled over a word or all the misplaced commas or misspelled words in the bulletin? Did you let the choir lead you in worshiping the Lord, or did you count all the times that maybe a breath may have been in the wrong place or a note may have gone a little flat? Not that the notes ever go flat. They don't. Are you engaging in what's going on right now? The preaching of the Word of God. Letting God speak to you through the scriptures and through the words of the sermon? Or are you grading the pastor's performance and keeping your eyes on your watch? Wondering how much longer is he going to keep talking? You see, we have a choice. The spirit with which we come into worship, the purpose the state of our heart as we come into worship. And remember, when Michal came with critique, it led to a lack of fruitfulness in her life and in her relationship with her husband. If we come to worship in this way, I guarantee there will be no blessing from that worship. There will be no fruit from that worship. We will miss the good news right among us. We will miss the joy of the Lord. Remember what David said in our second psalm, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Were you glad when you came into worship today? Are you glad to lift your heart to the Lord? Are you glad to hear the word of God? Are you glad to join the people of God in singing hallelujah? See, that's my prayer, that we will gladly fix our eyes upon the Lord, that we will gladly worship with all of our might, with our minds, with our hearts, with our hands, with our feet, that we will joyfully, gladly give thanks to God for all that he has done and all that he has promised to do, that we would come with repentance, eager to hear the good news of God again. For this is the kind of worship that bears fruit. This is the kind of worship that is infectious. It spreads. People want to be a part of joyful worship. And of course, the Lord is worthy of joyful worship with all of our might. So let us worship the Lord. Let us say hallelujah. Hallelujah. And to God alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we are indeed glad to be here today. We are so thankful for the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. We lift our hearts to you, Lord, and we pray that you would accept the worship that we are giving to you. We pray that you would come and move among us and kindle passion in our hearts and minds. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.